Chapter 15, Gray West Finishing this novel is probably a bad idea. Anytime a male in my family completes his magnum opus, he ends up dying a short while later. My father was a research chemist who spent years on the development of a new and revolutionary method of pesticide production for insect extermination. Two weeks after he completed his patent application, a tree fell onto his car, smashing through the windshield and killing him instantly. He was on his way to work and, oddly enough, the tree was toppled because it had been hollowed out at the base by apparently vengeful, industrious beetles. My grandfather learned the craft of filmmaking when he was in the army during World War II. He made several training shorts for the military. You know, with subjects like, Don't bang Italian prostitutes, you might regret it, and Making camp on the side of a steep hill during a heavy rainstorm is not a good thing to do. After retirement, he needed a hobby, and decided to make a full-length picture with a small theater company in town. They put together a fun little drama about professional baseball players, who ultimately decide to turn down gamblers' money and refuse to throw the World Series. They spent nine months on it, released it to a couple of nearby movie houses, and three months after the premiere, he was dead. He had been walking on the street outside a local ballpark when he was struck by a home run, batted over the right field wall by a minor league player. Great Uncle James was an artist specializing in airbrush, which was a relatively new technology in the 1930s and 40s. He lived in Chicago where he taught art classes at the Illinois Art School. When the war broke out, a large local machining company won a contract from the United States government to construct jeeps. They needed to expand their facilities and decided to build a new headquarters with a grand lobby. It was planned that the centerpiece of this new space would be a 150-foot-wide mural, greeting visitors with an image metaphorically representing hope, planning, technology, and military power. My great grand was chosen to paint this mural upon recommendation from the dean of the art school. The massive undertaking was completed six months later, and featured such inspiring images as U.S. soldiers saluting before the Washington Monument, dark-suited government men staring reverently at the American flag, a muscled young Adonis shoveling coal into a smelter, and a transparent god figure holding a newly minted bomber aloft in the sky. The mural was unveiled to great acclaim, and one month later the artist was dead. He had been walking along a sidewalk in town when a new army jeep broke loose from the back of a flatbed transport, rolled down a steep hill, and crushed him flat. Great-great-granddad mastered woodworking in his spare time. He worked for years on hand-carving an eight-foot-tall grandfather clock. It was beautiful, with intricate gears, and featured an animated bucking donkey that paraded on the hour. A week after he finished up and wound the clock for the first time, he was kicked in the head by his own donkey and died two days later. The first time a relative died after finishing a long work, it was sad. The second time, it was a strange coincidence. The third time it happened, everyone in the family figured it must have been a curse. Problem was, we couldn't think of anyone who might have cursed us, or why. I'm just going to go ahead and blame it on some Native American chief that an ancestor of mine wronged. Screwing over the Native Americans was the genesis of a lot of purported curses in the United States, and I really can't blame them. Have you ever heard about the curse of Tippecanoe? Beginning in 1840 and continuing for 120 years, Every U.S. president who was elected or re-elected in years ending with a zero died in office, either by the hand of an assassin or of natural causes. Harrison, Lincoln, Garfield, McKinley, Harding, Roosevelt, and Kennedy. Reagan was nearly killed by an assassin, but survived, and some people think that he broke the curse. The name of the curse comes from a battle between the Indian forces, led by Chief Tecumseh, and United States government forces, led by William Henry Harrison, at the Battle of Tippecanoe in the Indiana Territory. The Indians lost the battle, but Tecumseh's brother Tenskwatawa placed a curse on the presidency, beginning with future President Harrison himself, and continuing for generations. So while the origins of my curse have been lost to time, my relatives really believe in it. They believe it enough that I haven't told them about this novel. I don't want to worry them. If I mentioned it to my immediate family, they would definitely try to make me stop, and I can't do that. It's too important. If you're reading this story right now, that means it has been finished and published, so it's highly probable that I'm already dead. That's okay, though, because I'm putting myself into this book. 
It contains my philosophizing, my thoughts, and whatever wisdom I can muster. Yeah, little joke there. I don't have too much of that. If the book is published and I'm later crushed to death in the collapse of a historic farmhouse, run down by a car, or something of the sort that's entirely too strange to be coincidental, I'll still live on through my work, and I'll never die. I don't need to hope and pray that an afterlife exists. If there is a heaven, that's fine, but if not, I'm already taken care of. I put my family, my friends, places I've been, and things I've seen into the book as well. They're all jumbled up so you may not recognize them. I borrowed names, snatches of conversations that we had, bits of personality here and there. Some of the people associated with these elements are still living. Many of them are deceased. I'm in here with all my favorite people, so we can be together forever. Zip forward to the year 2101, when someone might find this antique novel on a dusty shelf in some used bookstore and read my story, and then we'll all live again. You know that standard boilerplate disclaimer that companies always stick at the beginning of a book or the end of a movie? The one that goes, the story, all names, characters, and incidents portrayed in this production are fictitious. No identification with actual persons, places, buildings, and products is intended or should be inferred. Well, that's a complete lie. This book is full of ghosts.